back to order. Counting those on, <clears throat> on by Zoom, we have a quorum present again. And we're going to continue with Senate File 5289, Senator Champion, the Jobs Finance Omnibus Bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for having us. Thank you to the committee for listening uh, to S Senate File 5289. We think it's a great bill. Mr. Chair, um, as you know, uh, our target was $1 million from the general fund, but I'm sure you'll see when Ms. Noner uh, walked through the spreadsheet, we spent more than that and still have some left on in our various committees. Um, uh, one thing is clear that we uh, appropriated $5 million last year uh, to the 2027 World Expo in Bloomington, which unfortunately did not get it, and we send our uh, condolences to uh, uh, Senator Wickland over there. And Belgrade, um, uh, Siberia was selected instead, and as a result, those funds uh, went back to uh, the Minnesota Investment Fund, which we have used for our bill instead of sending the, the money back to the general fund. We also, you will notice, and, and once uh, Ms. Noner goes through our spreadsheet, that we have uh, reallocated uh, money from the Job Creation Fund, uh, and we made some, some additional moves. Uh, just so the committee is clear that when the bill first came here, we had, we had taken a $6 million allocation from the butcher shop relocation grants under deed. That particular <clears throat> fund was done in 2021. Uh, and since that time, according to deed, and, and, and Dario Dannon is here, as you see in the audience, and she can correct me if I'm wrong, I want the committee to be clear that uh, it was a knit, it was initially for three um, companies, two of which has moved and the funds were not used. Then there was a, an amendment uh, to extend it and to try to create a situation where a, another business might be eligible. Um, and that amendment was done, or that modification was done last session. So coming up, um, as you know, next year, uh, if it's unused, that money will go to, to the general fund. But just so that we're clear, there's been zero, and you can hear me, zero re request on that fund. And some people, as of late, have been saying that there's an application. There, there has been submitted no application. Let me repeat that. There's been no submitted application, and in fact, uh, D didn't hear from anyone who was even curious about that fund until roughly two days ago, which is when my bill had gone through the process itself. And I want you to be clear that in order for someone to be even eligible, they got to submit an application. There's a, an extensive process that you have to go through, and because they did it under targeted capital uh, grants, they have to have all their money in before they can even access any money from this account. So it's a long process, and it's one that is really detailed. And so, members, just really be clear that the only reason why I'm making this change today and found some additional money is because I want to make sure that no one can go back and say that we took something, uh, but I want this committee to be clear, and, and Dario Dannon, who's from D, can, can verify no one has made any application at all, and just submitting an application alone does not do it. And so I want folks to be clear on that. So with that being said, I think it would be great for Ms. Nonard to go through our um, uh, uh, spreadsheet. But we think it's a great bill because what we tried to do is when we did Promise Act last year, there was some missing holes, and we attempted to, f to fill those holes. And we're still working on that language uh, to help with um, those those other cities and counties um, so that they will be eligible and it will be the same criteria as what's articulated in the Promise Act already. The other thing that you will see that we've made some uh, uh, made an appropriation to even Uptown, because one of the things that Senator Dibble talked about is that even once uh, um, uh, when the riots happen during George Floyd, their businesses have been struggling, and there's a portion of their biz biz businesses that would not be eligible under the current um, Promise Act structure, uh, but we did do something to try to be helpful 
uh, with the others because they have been decimated since George Floyd. And so we tried to be as responsive as possible. All in all, it, it's a great bill, and we look forward to uh, your support. So with that, Mr. Chair, if Ms. Nomner can, can go through our spreadsheet, that, that'd be great. Excuse me, Senator Champion, before she goes through the spreadsheet, did you want the, is it the A7 amendment? Did you want that put on because is that incorporated in the spreadsheet? Yes, um, so I would move the A7 amendment, Mr. Chair. Senator Champion moves the A7 amendment, which is to, well, if you could just briefly explain it for. So what it does, Mr. Chair, is that it, it changed the appropriation for its Special Olympics. The Special Olympics line now would be 2.9. Uh, million. Um, what it also does is changes the 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 source of the funds for the revised promise acts that, that I talked about for the other counties that we still have to and cities that we still have to work out that language with uh, Senator Pratt and the others, um, and it just makes sure that uh, um, everything aligns. Thank you. Is there any discussion on the A seven amendment? If not, all those in oh, favor no, say Mr. aye. Chair. Oh, Ms. Mr. Chair, sorry for my interruption. Um, Please go. I just wanted to point out uh, we may need to add a oral amendment to the A7. Okay. Um, on page 66, uh, the repealer is repealing the um, meat processing language that um, Senator Champion was just discussing. The amendment deletes... Um, lines 26 and 27, which is reducing the appropriation um, to the uh, targeted capital grant program. But the repealing, repealer language would, um, was also eliminating the meat processing language. So we may need to uh, add that to the oral amendment, or add that to the A7. Okay, do we? So really, Mr. Chair, what we're asking is, is, is uh, um, as a part of uh, the A7, and we want this oral amendment to be adopted as well, is it should simply say on page 66, delete section 14, and that would get us to oh, the place okay. of space where yeah, we need so, to be. So the amendment, um, in, in effect, instead of deleting lines 26 and 27 on page 66, you'd be deleting 26 through the end of the page. In and so, no, it's in addition to. Right, but you'd yes. be deleting lines 26 through 30 on that page. Yep. Yes. Okay, just so members of the committee, if you're looking at page 66, the amendment would now be incorporated not just to delete lines 26 and 27, but also section 14, the last three lines of the page. Hold on, uh, Mr. Chair, just, just so that we're clear, because I'm, I'm listening to these two wonderful insightful, intelligent women here. Um, so perhaps I should just let Senate Council Please. tell us exactly what the change should be sure. on the A7 and its impact. Yes, Ms. Mr. Chair, members. Um, so the, the copy of the first engrossment I'm looking at um, does have it, page 66, lines 28 to 30. Yes, and I was okay, saying but, the, but the, the, bill, the amendment's already <coughs> deleting 26 and 27, right? So I'm just Mr. saying Chair, that's you're correct. deleting, for our sake, for understanding, you're deleting, I think we're talking the same thing. We're deleting the last five lines of that page. Correct. But I, I believe the correct instruction okay. is just to delete, delete yes, section delete, 14. Yes, yes. You're, correct. You are adding, Senator Champion incorporates in his amendment page 66, delete section 14. That's incorporated into the amendment A7 now. Is there any discussion of the amendment? If not, all those, Senator Pappas. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, there are there are people here in the audience who are from the meatpacking plant, and I'm just wondering if you wanted, if there any reason to hear from them for a minute to say they are in process of applying for this grant, um, and are working with a, the state architect and are working with Deed. Uh, so, M Mr. Chair, we think after we present our bill, if if the chair wants to do that, I know that okay. is a deviation from the way that this is usually done. But we're okay with once we present our bill, and and then we can scoot over and and let them say something. And Deed is here as well to say that there are no. Okay. Mr. Chairman, just if you feel further clarification, yeah. if this takes us back to current law, 
this is repealing the repealer of that, and it's keeping the six million dollars in the fund available. So okay. I think that's the concern you were saying yeah. your witnesses would have. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we will, if, if this amendment's adopted, then um, if people in the committee want testimony, we can take it. Otherwise, we will not. Um, on the A7 amendment, is there further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the A7 amendment say aye. aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. A7 is adopted. Um, so, Ms. Nolner? Sir, champion, go ahead. Uh, Ms. Gunnar-Nolner, now you're ready to go through the spreadsheet. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, I will be walking through the spreadsheet in your packets um, titled Jobs and Economic Development, Senate File 5289, as proposed to be amended by a the A7. Um, with a timestamp of 12.32 p.m. in the bottom right-hand corner. So I'll begin with um, just touching on how the spreadsheet is laid out. Uh, the first few lines here are showing the summary of all of the funds impacted under this jurisdiction um, and the net totals. And then from lines four, on line 14, uh, and below, this is the detail of the spending as well as um, revenue, which shows up on the second page. So I'll go into detail um, beginning on line uh, 23 under deed. An appropriation for Fortis Capital Revolving Loan Fund of 300000 in fiscal year 2025 uh, is a one-time funding. Line 24, 100000 for a butchery shop relocation, one-time funding. For the Black Chamber of Commerce, 300,000 in fiscal year 2025, one time. For the Coalition of Asian American Leaders, 300,000 in fiscal year 2025, one time. For the YWCA St. Paul, 200,000 in fiscal year 2025, one time. On line 28, for the Block Builders Foundation, 50,000 in fiscal year 2025, one time. On line 29, there's an appropriation for employment support for persons with mental illness. And um, essentially this appropriation is being uh, canceled on line 36 and being reappropriated here to extend the availability of funds. And this is an amount that's already existing uh, in, in the jobs budget just being uh, tweaked with here to extend the availability of the funds. On lines, make sure I got the right line numbers. On lines 29 and 30, um, there are two reductions to um, base funding for the Minnesota Film and TV Board uh, program. And this base funding is being reappropriated uh, later on in the spreadsheet for the Explore Minnesota Film Office and I'll touch on that once we get there, but the two appropriations here that are being reduced um, is first the matching dollars for the Film and TV Board of $325,000 a year beginning in 2025. And then uh, for the TV Board in general, there was an appropriation for $500,000 a year that is being reduced um, beginning fiscal year 2025 and ongoing. Then on lines 32 through 34, um, there's additional funding being added to the Promise Act grants. Uh, first, on line 33, the first year there's $1 million being appropriated for South Minneapolis, South Hennepin, and Uptown regions. On, lines, on line 30, excuse me, on line 33, um, 34, excuse me, Chair, uh, looking at two versions of the spreadsheet here. On line 34, the seven county metro um, region, excluding Minneapolis and St. Paul, receiving $3, three million dollars in fiscal year 2025 one time under the Promise Act. On line 35, in the tails, beginning in fiscal year 2026, there's a reduction of $2 million a year. Um, this was a recommendation by deed to correct um, uh, uh, an appropriation made last year to in increase operating funds, but deed no longer needs those funds in the tails. 
On line 36, this is the appropriation that was showing up on line 29, uh, just a reduction here. Um, and again, that's being made so that the funds can be made available longer in the second year. On line 37, a uh, million dollars is being uh, reduced from an appropriation to the city of Minneapolis for Lake Street Corridor um, from last year's uh, laws 2023 chapter 64. On line 38, there's a cancellation of the Expo 2027 funding of $5 million. As Senator Champion explained, this was included in last year's jobs omnibus bill and um, was not received by Bloomington, so the money is being canceled. Then on lines 40 through 52, uh, this is showing workforce development fund changes. And I'll just note to members that the totals here uh, need to be corrected. So on line 40, um, the second year, the total amount should read 3.8 million. And the total amount for fiscal year 24-25 should read 4.875 million. Beginning on line 41 for the Shakopee area workforce development scholarships, 700,000 in the first year is appropriated one time. For Inspire Change Clinic, 250,000 is appropriated in the second year one time. 250,000 uh, one time funding again for Boulder Options Youth Mentoring Program. Then on line 44, 1 million for North Minneapolis change starts with the community one time. Line 45 for meat cutting grants. In the first year, $375,000 one time. Line 46 for Inspire MSP, $100,000 uh, in one time funding in fiscal year 2025. Line 47 for child care business management solutions, $1 million in one time funding. On line 48 for Lake County Ambulance Service Training Program, $100,000 one time. For the City of Austin, training for water operators and wastewater operators, $350,000 one time. On line 50 for STEM training, $250,000 one time. Line 51 for VOCAL Workforce Development Program, $400,000 one time. Line 52, Community Animal Medicine Professionals, $100,000 in the second year, one time. On line 55, um, this is a transfer from the Jobs Creation Fund to the General Fund, um, showing an expenditure to the Special Revenue Fund of $3 million. Moving on to Explore Minnesota Tourism, there are three appropriations in Senate File 5289 for Explore. First, um, on line 60 for the Special Olympics US Games, 2.903 million in the second year and one time funding. On line 61, uh, this is the appropriation I discussed earlier from lines 30 to 31. The total of the, those reductions indeed are being uh, moved to explore total of 825,000 a year being appropriated uh, for the Explore Minnesota Film Office, and that is ongoing funding. On line 62 for Taste of Minnesota, uh, 1.847 million in the second year. And I'll uh, move to the second page. The rest of the spreadsheet is just showing the other agencies and um, budget issues that fall under the jobs jurisdiction and just showing that there's no changes made to the other areas under this jurisdiction. On line 76, um, this is just showing revenue changes uh, based on the changes being made in F Senate File 5289. And this is the transfer from the Job Creation Fund bringing $3 million into the general fund. So I'll just direct members to um, the net total again on line four uh, for the general fund for fiscal year 24-25 is a net total of one million. And in the tails, fiscal year 26-27, uh, a net total savings of four million. And on line five, this is the workforce development fund net total. Again, the totals here just need to be uh, corrected. So in fiscal year 2025, this should read 3.8 million. And the total for fiscal year 24-25 should read 4.875 million. And there's only one-time funding uh, from the Workforce Development Fund. 
On line six, this is just a special revenue fund. Again, the uh, job creation transfer, creating a $3 million um, cost for the special revenue fund. And with that, um, actually I just have a few, other, a few other things to mention in article one, um, changes to riders or any other sections that might not be reflected in the spreadsheet. First, um, section one of article one, Paragraph B is uh, limiting administrative costs. Um, this is similar to the uh, Minnesota statute section 16B.98 that we've been discussing on other bills today. Uh, in this bill, we are um, notwithstanding that, sub that uh, statute with um, the allowance of deed to continue using 5% for administrative costs uh, for grants made under this act. Section four of article one um, is just correcting totals from last year's bill based on the changes in this bill. Sections five through six have uh, small rider changes to the language. Um, these changes should show up on pages 33 and 48. And um, most of the most of the pages underneath these sections are just pulling in the subdivision from last year, so that's why the bill is um, the length that it is, uh, just because the way that uh, bill drafting is done, we're not able to pull a single paragraph from a subdivision. Sections uh, nine through 10 uh, have some forward fund language updates. And finally, section 11, has some reporting requirements uh, for appropriations made under this act. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll stand for any questions. Uh, Are there any have. questions for Ms. Wogner? And if not, does Ms. Fontaine Doyle have any? Go ahead. Thank you, quick. Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Nolner, so we're, we're taking out it, through the ACE 7 amendment and as shown on the worksheet, we're taking $3 million out from the job creation fund. How much is left in that fund that's unencumbered? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, I believe that the current balance of the fund was $8 million, so with $3 million being taken, uh, $5 million would be remaining. Senator Pratt. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Ms. Nolner. And is of, of that entire $8 million, was that all unencumbered, or were some of that already um, allocated to, to certain projects? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, I don't believe so, but I may um, phone a friend for uh, Ms. Dannon. Ms. Dannon, welcome to the committee, and please identify yourself and go ahead. Chair Marty, uh, members of the committee, my name is Darielle Dannon, and I am the Government Relations Director for DEED. Um, so to the question, uh, I think one of the distinctions that we want to make is that we are talking about the Special Revenue Fund for the Job Creation Fund. And so that does indeed, it, it has a balance before the transfer of $8 million. Um, so none of those funds are encumbered for individual projects as of yet. Of course, for that program, we receive applications, and then for projects that um, qualify for the funding, we make those awards as those, things, as those applications come in. So um, hopefully that's helpful to your question. Thank you. And Happy to answer any other questions. And uh, while she's here, Mr. Chair, because I think the answer is uh, Senator Pratt's question, uh, uh, can mm -hmm. we get Ms. Dan and Alan just to talk about the, um, the fund that, that we initially had, uh, which is the butcher, the butcher Shop Relocation Grants, and what that was, and, and any sure. questions around that, because I just wanted that clear, clarity to be placed on the record. Please, could you go ahead with that? Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, other Chair. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, happy to talk about that. Uh, so as um, Senator Champion already testified to, um, we as an agency, so, we originally received an appropriation for the, I'm going to call it the meatpacking appropriation for $6 million. So that was a carve-out carve of the um, uh, 
targeted community capital projects uh, fund. And we received that funding initially in 2021. Um, the language was a little bit unclear, so we did spend a significant amount of time going back and forth trying to determine how we were supposed to um, award those funds. We had identified, as uh, Senator Champion um, already alluded to, we had identified that there were likely three butchers that met the criteria of the program. I think that was potentially uh, contrary to what folks were maybe assuming when they put the language together. So as an agency, we were in a little bit of a bind there. Um, and so we did do some work with folks in 2023 to amend that language to provide a little additional clarity. In the intervening period of time, there are also uh, two of those butchers, I believe, have, has left. So one of them has moved to Winona, and I think the other one was renting and has left. So um, some things have changed changed as well since uh, 2021. But um, as, as the center had alluded to, uh, as an agency, after the 23 language changes had passed, we did send out an application to uh, the, the business in question here um, and have been working with the city, but we have not received an application for those funds yet. And that is the thing that we received before we would get a grant agreement and a budget together. So we are, I would say, on the very early stages of this one. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that, that staff did reach out to our staff who were assigned to this project a few days ago, and they did have a conversation about sort of all the different components that need to come together before we can get that both application and then grant agreement. So things are on the front end, I would say, and perhaps the senator's bill has uh, triggered some renewed interest in this funding. And, and, and Mr. Chair, uh, if Ms. Dana can just also talk about what are the other components because some, sometimes people think that you just put an application in and that's it and there's a whole lot more that goes to being able to, to access this grant, this appropriation. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you, Chair. Um, so happy to talk about that. So for this application and, and what our, our staff did talk through with um, the consultant on this is that we are going to be adhering to the capital grants requirements. So uh, this will require the uh, grantee to have full funding for their project. They also will need to have worked with and then have sign off from the um, capital architect. Um, we are going to put a lien on the property. Just all of the, I, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but I think those are sort of the highlights of the components that are required on any project where the state has capital funds in. So it will be a little bit more of an extensive process than um, maybe, maybe folks would think of with a regular grant. This is indeed a capital grant. Feel free to add other, other comments. Yeah. Any further questions from Ms. Dannon? Senator Pappas. Um, so <clears throat> um, I think Mr. Fang has left, but Ms. Maharath is still here. Yeah, if the committee is interested in hearing any additional comments on this. Yeah, so you should come up and uh, tell us if you have yeah. uh, put forth a, an application or anything. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, for entertaining this. Um, my name is Tina Maharath, uh, spelled M-A-H-A-R-A-T-H. I do currently represent Long King Meat Processing Center that's located in South St. Paul. However, they just started their contract with me last month. So um, to provide some context, uh, Long King Meats Processing Center opened up in 1989 and is owned by uh, Hmong refugees from Laos. So shortly after they resettled here in Minnesota, they decided to take a part of the American dream and start a, a meat processing center that provides meats for culturally um, or for cultural events that has to do with everyone's different culture and their beliefs. So as a result, um, they've been around South St. Paul for over 30 years now. Um, they were granted this um, opportunity for funding back in 2021. However, as I mentioned, uh, the owner is a refugee from Laos, so his language barriers and cultural barriers at that um, had him a, kind of being in a lost loophole of what are next steps with this grant? How do I obtain it, et cetera? He did hire an architect back in 2021 who was supposed to assist with this whole process, but unfortunately the architect hired back in 2021 did not make any communications with Deed or even start the process, and they actually cheated him out of money. So um, fast forward to uh, today, uh, when he did hire me just last month, uh, we did get everything squared away with a new architect who actually is in the works of trying to get a pre-design uh, approved 
through the state architect, and afterwards, it, which is directions that we were told from deed. Afterwards, after everything's done, there was two other additional applications that we were told that we needed to submit in order to start the grant writing process. And this communications that we've been having for several several weeks. So um, it's not something that got triggered within the last two days. So we have been constantly trying to work with deed, but of course with. Um, Mr. Yang's uh, language barriers, it's just oftentimes hard to communicate what are the needs, and he unfortunately just could not navigate the government system, which is why he had to hire a consultant like me to try to get this situation worked out. So I w will be able to answer any questions if there are any. Are there any questions for the committee? Not, so, um, uh, Mr. Chair, to, to the testifiers, so uh, when did you get hired by, by the organization? Yes, so... Uh, through the chair, to the other chair. I got hired by organization back in um, March 1st, but he did previously hire my previous firm that I was working with as well, Hilden Law, um, back in, uh, I want to say, it was probably June or July, this past June or July, where um, one of my associates were able to try to get him the application. And, and just for clarity, uh, uh, that there's been no application submitted up to this particular this point is that correct to the chair to the other chair yes that is correct no application has officially been submitted but we have been working with the grant coordinator to ensure that we do have the application in hand okay. is there any further questions from anyone if not thank you very much thank you chair thank you senators for senator, um, having us senator champion um did you want to have Ms. Doyle Fontaine go through anything, or is she just here for questions? She, she's just here for questions. And, okay. and uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to say that even though the, uh, uh, the uh, lobbyist is here, our committee never heard anything from her or anyone until after our bill was put, put forward. Uh, and even to this day, this is my first time sitting next to her and for her even saying anything about what is happening. I know that, that once the bill came out that she had a conversation with, with Tom yet yesterday, my CA, but I just want the record to reflect that as well. Thank you. Um, so Ms. Fontaine is only needed if there are any questions. Are there any questions? Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and um, thank you, Senator Champion. I, you know, I do recall we, this, this wasn't an issue in your committee. This isn't a committee we normally take uh, public testimony in. Um, you know, we, as we heard with the censure, they're, they're there for questions if we ask them, but I know this is the second time that we've, uh, we've allowed testimony in this committee, and so I'm glad to know the new standard. Um, Senator Champion or, or Ms. Nolder, my other question goes back to the A7 again. As I was doing a little bit of math, we have um, a $1.1 billion dollar uh, cut in Special Olympics that's not made up anywhere else. Um, I'm curious, you know, this is a, a, a very important event for us and uh, the region and, and particularly for the, uh, uh, for the athletes. And I want to make sure that we've, you know, we do have sufficient funding or there's avenues to have that uh, funding replaced. Uh, so, Mr. Chair, and to uh, Senator Pratt, Senator Pratt, it is a very important um, event and we recognize the importance of it and our commitment is as we go in the conference committee if there's an opportunity to find additional funds we will certainly do so and as you probably know before we made the changes that we needed to make here because of never hearing from anyone and never having any conversation in our committee that that we had to make some some changes and we had to remove some other funds so we will continue to work on it and just want you to know that that's that is a part of our commitment Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Pratt, did you have further? Okay. Is there further discussion on the bill? No further discussion. Senator Champion um, moves that Senate File 5289 as amended be recommended to pass. That's my motion, Mr. Chair. Is there any further discussion? I'm having to check online, see if anybody has hands raised. No. Um, no further discussion on that motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Champion. Thank you, staff and everyone. We have one bill remaining on the agenda. It's one we took up the other day. Senator Umu Verbatim. 
we're going to have to distribute the packets for that, but while you're coming up, we will do that. Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Might I just request a five-minute recess so that yes. uh, maybe we can uh, get the we packets do. handed out and maybe pull up some of our uh, materials from the last meeting? Yes. Um, with that, the committee is in recess for five minutes. Senate Finance Committee will come back to order. We have one bill remaining, Senate File 4483, which we took up the other day and put on the A34 amendment. And Senate Council, Ms. Stangle, maybe you could explain where we stand now. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think you hit the highlights. We heard this bill and laid it over on Tuesday. The A34 amendment was adopted, which you'll see in your packets. Uh, there was a blank on line 1.12 and 1.14 of that amendment, and we were waiting for the fiscal note. The fiscal note has now been completed. You'll see the A35 in the packet, which amends the A34 to fill in those blanks. Thank you. Um, so the A35 amendment would be before Senator Umu Verbaten. Did you have any questions before we take up the amendment and comments to make? I'm sorry. Senator Pratt. Mr. Chair, would it be appropriate now or do you want to do it after the amendment to uh, walk through the changes in the fiscal note? Uh, this was assumed it would be there, but let's, um, I figure the fiscal note is reflecting, this is reflecting the fiscal note, I believe. Um, Mr. Olson says yes. And um, so I would be inclined to just put the amendment on and then do that unless you have objection to that. Senator, yes, yes, we should go through it again. Senator Murphy moves the A35 amendment to fill in the blanks on the A34 amendment. Is there any discussion of that? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion, no. motion prevails. Senator, well, let's see, I, I assume then, Mr. Olofsson, do you want to go through the revised fiscal note which is in the packets uh, yes uh, mr. chair members of the committee in your packets you should have a fiscal note with revised at the top of the fiscal note for Senate file 4483 3e so on the front page of the fiscal note uh, the main change you'll see is for the Attorney General it now shows a cost of 98,000 beginning in fiscal year 26 from the general fund each ongoing so in fiscal year 26 and 27 for and now there's another change for the net uh, cost slash savings to the general fund to the state on page one. You'll see, it, so it's still a net cost of $199,000 from the general fund in fiscal year 25. And then net savings now of 544,000 to the general fund ongoing beginning in fiscal year 26. So the main, the page that has changed on the fiscal notes are pages 15 and 16, so I'll direct members there. So here, this is for the Attorney General. Again, you'll see a net cost, that net cost of $98,000 uh, beginning in fiscal year 26 uh, to, to the Attorney General's office from the general fund. So th this is where, as DLI assumes that the AGO will represent uh, DLI in those three contested case hearings that we discussed on Tuesday. Uh, this leads to about 600 hours of attorney time to the AGO, which leads to uh, at, 100, at a hourly billing rate of $163. You get to times that by 600, you come to that $98,000 per fiscal year beginning in FY26. And that, that encapsulates all the changes to the fiscal note that I walked through on Tuesday. So with that, happy to answer any questions. Questions for, for Mr. Olofsson or on the spreadsheet or anything? If no, is there discussion on the bill? And I will comment that um, this is, this 90, this money is being covered by the labor budget and we have talked with the budget chair and they are aware of this and they were expecting this when they passed the bill out to us. They now know the numbers they have to fill in. Is there further discussion on the bill? 
Thank you. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, you know, we, if, if I recall, it's been a couple of days, but if I recall, we were having a conversation about, about the fines. Um, it seems to me that um, a, a good chunk of the fiscal note uh, ends up being um, a revenue generator for the Department of Labor. Um, we're, we're certainly assessing more in fines and, um, than are needed in order to cover the cost of enforcement. Uh, I was wondering if uh, Senator Umar Bay could tell me what the, what the plan is for those, for those fines. How are those being used? Senator Umar Bay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, for the question. Um, I would defer to DLI on where the fines actually go back in um, the fund, but I can say just uh, in terms of the bill itself, it's really um, an enforcement tool to deter these businesses from um, pursuing a business model that's based on misclassification. Um, I'm not sure if they go back into the general fund for labor. Perhaps council can speak to that for DLI. Commissioner, you want to, Commissioner Blissenbach, welcome to the committee if you want to comment on it. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee. My name is Nicole Blissenbach. I serve as the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. And penalties that we collect through our labor standards unit are um, put it back into the general fund. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, commissioner, Senator Umber Baton, how does, um, how, does the aggrieved, how does the aggrieved employee who's been misclassified um, collect the damages that, that they may be owed? Uh, Mr. Chair, well, I would just point out that there's also that private right of action for employees to sue for um, misclassification where they could directly ask for, you know, those um, lost wages, um, unemployment insurance, taxes, right, all those different components that go into misclassification. Commissioner. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Pratt. So there are a couple different things that can happen with regard to the individually affected employee or employees. Um, one, if there is a separate violation of a different law that is related to but not the specific violation of misclassification, there are remedies available. So for instance, if you are a misclassified employee and because of that you did not receive overtime or minimum wage, um, the, the department can take action under the uh, Fair Labor, Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act to collect those wages and potentially liquidate damages uh, for the unpaid wages, uh, and those go to the employee. There is also a provision in this bill that talks about compensatory damages related to misclassification as its own separate violation. Uh, sometimes there is misclassification that doesn't result in wage and hour violations, uh, and this bill would allow compensatory damages, uh, if there are any, to be paid to that employee. Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner, for that. And, you know, certainly we've had a lot of discussion around um, employees being compensated fairly. As, as, you know, the chief author of the wage theft bill, I, I spent a lot of time on, on making sure that, you know, people are paid what they're owed. Um, given the fact that we expect $700,000 to be collected um, each and every biennium for this bill, or actually every year I think it is, uh, that it becomes not a deterrent, it becomes a, rev it, it becomes a, a revenue source for the state. If we were a deterrent, we would expect to see those numbers drop. Um, we have a long history of having um, a process for identifying and correcting uh, misclassification. It, it 
should never happen. Um, but, you know, quite honestly, as I've looked through the, the you know, the nine-point test, the, the federal six-point test, I can understand where maybe somebody does uh, make a mistake or, or two people that, that think it's an individual contractor uh, uh, agreement um, does, in fact, uh, violate it, and, and, you know, we get those, we get this resolved. We're obviously expecting to find more people. And none of it's going back to the person who's actually aggrieved. I don't know, Mr. Chair, that we should be collecting $650,000 a year to cover our, our structural deficit. And so, Mr. Chair, with that, I would offer the A31 amendment. Senator Pratt offers the A31 amendment. Do you have the amendment? No. Senator Verbatim does not have the amendment yet. Okay, Senator Pratt, the A31 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Since these, um, since these penalties are going into the general fund, um, this simply redirects those, uh, a portion of those monies uh, back to the commissioner to reimburse um, and compensate the people who are uh, who have been in fact uh, aggrieved in this process, who were in fact misclassified. Um, whether it's the you know for compensatory losses or punitive losses, I don't think as Senator Umuber Baton has has highlighted that once we find someone. Um, Culpable, uh, uh, guilty of of this misclassification and and going through an administrative fine, that then we should make them have to take the expense of finding a lawyer and going into civil court and delaying this process any further. Um, so, Mr. Chair, this is just a very simple amendment that is going to take all, uh, a, a portion of the revenue that is is um, is collected and redistribute to those who have been harmed through the action. Senator Umuver Baton. Thank you, Mr. Amendment. Chair. Um, I do appreciate the spirit of this amendment, Senator Pratt. Um, I do just want to, cl again, clarify for folks that um, there are there are provisions in the bill, whether we're looking at the private right of action that I mentioned that you'll see um, starting on line, uh, page six, line 18, or if it's DLI leading the charge starting on uh, page 13, line 14, those damages that can be, be collected that are going back to um, the, um, to, the uh, to the workers themselves. Um, for being misclassified. Again, laying out what some of those damages are, um, which could be vacation pay, sick pay, um, health insurance, the unemployment insurance, all those pieces that go into misclassification. I think if we were uh, to uh, adopt this amendment, there would be some issues with just the kind of spreadsheet here. Um, and there, again, are these penalties for the act of doing it itself, but there is... There is already in this bill um, a way for either DLI or the affected worker themselves to collect um, back um, lost wages or um, just anything that they lost due to misclassification. So I don't think this is necessary. Definitely happy to keep talking about how we can make sure that we quickly um, get those get that money back to workers that they deserve. Uh, 
Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Umar Verbaten. Um, you know, when we did the wage theft bill, we included the compensation for those employees back in, in that wage theft bill. What was collected in back wages through that process was distributed to the employees. If somebody has been aggrieved through this process, I don't know why they're not seeing this. What, what I hear you saying is that this is intended to be a way for the state or the, because it's, it's certainly not staying in the agency budget if it's going to the general fund. So this is simply a way to improve the state's finances through assessing additional penalties. That's, that's how I understand it. And that if someone needs to uh, collect these, these uh, uh, monies that are owed to them, that they have to go through the civil, uh, uh, the civil process and taking the expense and time to be able to do that. I think that's uh, unconscionable, and I think we should uh, make this change and encourage members to vote yes on the, uh, on the amendment. Mr. Chair. Senator Umu Verbaten, go ahead. Thank you. Again, Senator Pratt, whether they decide to do that on their own or um, DLI takes that action, they will ask the employer could be um, asked to pay back uh, damages to compensatory damages to the worker. That's outlined in both the civil remedy and what DLI does. I do just want to make a point that like the society as a whole is also being hurt by misclassification um, because those business owners should be paying into our social safety nets like unemployment insurance, like paid family medical leave, like earned sick and safe time. So we are losing money from our general fund. And I do think there's a role for those general penalties that are then gonna come back into our general fund because of how misclassification does impact us all. Senator Pratt, continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Mover Baton. But the whole point of uh, the compensatory piece is to make sure that those, those back charges are in fact refilled and to uh, uh, not to hold the state or, or any of those benefits um, uh, from being short. So in, in your own testimony and saying that we were going to collect those, those pieces through these other channels um, and not through the penalty, because I don't see anything in this penalty um, that is being distributed to any of the uses that you said. So I'm assuming that uh, society is made whole through the enforcement process. And this is just simply a way for us to um, close the structural deficit that we'll be facing in the next biennium. It's, it's a small amount, I get that, um, but it's, it's uh, you know, over, uh, over uh, uh, 1.2 uh, 1. million over the, uh, uh, over the biennium, I think, is uh, pretty significant. So, uh, again, members, we should be distributing a, a portion of these funds to the people who have been aggrieved um, and I encourage a yes vote. I will um, point out to members that, well, in addition to the fact that the misclassified employees have some of their own recourse and that the department, when they get this, asks them to make whole the misclassified employees. In addition to that, this one, which may be good intentions of, to do this, I also know that, that Senator McEwen, in putting together her budget, has allotted for money for the bill's income and the costs of this bill, assuming a $98,000 addition, which we were adding into the bill today. So I believe this would break her, her ability, the agreement on how much she was allowed to allocate out this year. So I will urge members to reject the amendment. Um, Senator Dames and Senator Draham have their hands up as well. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just wanted to address this issue that Senator Pratt's talking about. I think it's kind of interesting how many bills we see going through the different department, the different uh, different uh, agencies uh, that are trying to scurry money up to put in the general fund. I think it's really unfortunate that uh, we overspent last year, we're in a structural deficit, and now we're scurrying around doing everything we can to array to find money to put in the general fund, and usually it's at the expense of the businesses. And I just think that it's interesting 
And when we talk about it, we really can't get a real good straight answer. We get a lot of him and haw. And so I'm going to vote for the amendment. I think that we need to uh, start looking at how we spend and not how, so much how we're going to raise the money to cover all that crazy spending. Senator Jayham, then Senator Murphy. Thank you. Um, I couldn't agree more with uh, Senator Deems. I, I, <laughs> employees already have the right to do civil action uh, if they are wronged on compensation. Um, and, and that was the main talking uh, point from the author. Um, so I, I think it's only natural if we're going to have a, a, a fee that it should go to the the purpose of the bill, and that would be to protect workers and compensate workers. So I support the Pratt Amendment. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, uh, Senator Umar Verbaten, uh, I am delighted that we are uh, going to move this today through finance. Uh, I, I think about the basic premise of the bill which is about protecting workers from employers who are either systemically or perhaps inadvertently misclassifying employees, which you've described as uh, both a harm to a worker, but also um, a broader harm to the sort of the social contract that we have with workers and what people who go to work as employees uh, benefit from. And it seems to me that if we put this system in place, um, and we are pursuing employers who are misclassifying employees, that one of the benefits for the worker is they will be properly classified, um, which will, I would imagine, increase their earning potential um, and their participation in the benefits you're describing, um, like unemployment insurance. And I'm just wondering if you or the commissioner could verify that my train of argument here is correct. Mr. Chair. Senator, we'll move for Baton. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, thank you, Senator Murphy. In, in general, if folks are classified properly, then um, we have the employer paying for those taxes, paying into some of the social safety nets we talk about. Um, and um, that's important for the contract that you um, described. And again, if they have been misclassified, they should have those compensatory damages that are laid out in the bill. And there should be fines for the act of doing misclassification to deter folks. Um, we, we are all hurting from misclassification, workers especially first and foremost, um, but, the, but the community as a whole um, is losing out um, because of misclassification. Further discussion on the A31, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and actually, Mr. Chair, my, my question is to you based on a comment you made a, a couple of minutes ago. Is it my understanding that while this bill and this fiscal note shows that the money is going uh, to the, the general fund bottom line, there's an intent by Senator McEwen to spend, the, to spend these funds? Uh, Senator Pratt, what we have, we gave Senator McEwen a target for the labor budget, and this bill is not carried in the omnibus labor budget bill, but it's traveling separately, but they have agreed to cover the costs of the bill, and this bill is in their jurisdiction, and the revenues gained and lowered by the bills they passed have to factor into their budgets. And so she is, was aware of this when they passed the bill out. She, they, we, they passed that without this $98,000 um, expense from the Attorney General's office, because as it was pointed out, there was confusion between the Attorney General's office assumed they were not covering this cost, and the agency assumed they were. And when that was pointed out, we had the new fiscal note. That's why the bill is back today. But all the revenues and expenditures of this have to be covered by Senator McEwen's bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if I read the fiscal note correctly, um, there is a, uh, a net gain to the general fund of, of it's, it's changed here a little bit. And so uh, with the new fiscal note, uh, $544,000 per fiscal year. Um, 
I understand that that's probably a line item that's being carried forward in uh, Senator McEwen's um, uh, labor labor uh, omnibus bill, but I mean, this is money that we're, we're showing is falling to the bottom line. And my question is, is it being expended in, in that bill or is it being shown uh, as a savings? Um, um, Senator Pratt, her bill would show, her bill, the target number she has is what she, her impact on the bottom line is. So if she is given a target of a million dollars, her net change on the bottom line can be a million dollars. And if she's adding money to the bottom line and taking money away from the bottom line, the net has to be what her target is. So she gets to, to add things to it and take things away from it. Just the total net has to be within her target. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I understand from, from your comment then, Senator McEwen expects to use this money uh, in order to increase her target and spend it so she ends up at a net million dollars. Uh, Senator Pratt, I, I, her budget is, is yes, it has to stay within the million dollars. Ms. May I ask fiscal a, a question? Uh, Let's go ahead. Mr. Nauman, um, can, you, can you tell me, is, uh, is this money being spent in the uh, labor omnibus bill? Mr. Chair and um, Senator Pratt, as I understand it, the labor omnibus bill received a uh, target of a million dollars in 24 and 25 and a net zero in 26 and 27. Given what the chair's uh, saying to you in response to the discussion that the two of you have had, um, Senator McEwen's labor omnibus and accumulated ancillary bills, because I understand that it would be the omnibus and then there'd be a few other bills that that, that committee is taking responsibility for paying for, that all in that it will net out at a zero in the tail. So I think to your question, as I understand the answers that you've received, um, uh, that her plan will be to net at zero. I don't know that to be a fact, but I, that's how I interpret the information that I have received. Thank you, Mr. Nauman. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we're talking about helping out workers. We're talking about the, the cost, the societal cost of this, of this program. Um, based on what we have in front of us, it looked like the state was trying to close its statutory uh, deficit through penalties. And now what we hear is that we're going to be using this as a tool to spend, to increase the state budget more than what the, the initial target had said it should be. And in the meantime, it's the, the, the worker who was misclassified, who was truly aggrieved, that's not being compensated. They have to go through all sorts of different hoops in order to collect the money that they're owed. And there's no distribution to cover the societal cost. Nothing in this bill. And I would suspect nothing in the, uh, uh, in the upcoming labor bill either. And I just, I just think it's, it's really um, unethical for us to be using penalties in order to cover uh, additional spending in a state budget, especially after we've increased the state budget 40% last year. Mr. Chair. And I want to make sure that we get this, uh, this money to the people who have actually been hurt by the misclassification members. So I, I encourage a yes vote. Senator Umu Verbaten. You know, I totally agree that it needs to go to the folks that are misclassified, and that's why there's compensatory damages in here um, so that we hold those employers accountable. They do need to pay their employees for what they stole from them. They stole this money from them. Um, they're also stealing from the state and they're stealing from our social safety net. But I think Commissioner Bliss and Bach can talk about all the work that the department does to make sure those employers do get that money back to the to the workers. Commissioner. 
Mr. Chair, um, members of the committee, I just want to make it very clear on the record that when the department investigates a case, whether it involves wage and hour violations or misclassification, the number one goal in resolving that case is to ensure that the worker receives everything that was taken from them, whether that be the compensatory damages for sick leave they should have been entitled to that they weren't because they were misclassified or overtime or minimum wage. Um, in addition to the liquidated damages that they're entitled to under the Minnesota Fair Labor Standards Act. That is the number one goal when we are looking at cases and resolving those cases after they've been investigated and violations um, are shown. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, you know, Senator Umu Verbaten, we can go around on this uh, all day. Um, you can talk about how they already have the avenue for compensatory damages, and you're right. Uh, I don't think they should have to go through that process. That's the difference between you and I. I don't think they should have to go through that process. I don't think they should have to take the time. They shouldn't have to take the expense. We increased taxes nine point, over $9 billion last year, and I think it's wrong for us to use a penalty in order to increase taxes again in order to either cover a structural deficit or uh, to cover increased spending in another area. This money should be going to the people who were aggrieved, and, I, and, and that's what this vote basically symbolizes, and I encourage members to vote yes. And I will point out that Senator Umu Verbaten just said again that, and the commissioner said as well, that what the department is doing in going after these cases is making sure the employees get their compensation that's due, and they also have compensatory damages they can seek themselves. And, um, and as far as um, your constant characterization of a, of a deficit, we are not in a deficit. We're not operating with one, and we don't intend to be, and that's why we're trying to keep the chairs with the budgets we have given them, and it's very routine for chairs to raise revenue in their budgets to cover other things or to take revenue that was unspent or other things. They have that flexibility to do that so they manage their budget as wisely as they can. And Senator Muhammad and Senator Westrom also want to speak on this, I know. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my comments are to the amendment. Um, I appreciate Senator Pratt for bringing it forward because I think when I first read it, I actually was like, wow, this is going straight to the employee, to the employees, which I really appreciate. Um, and I've had some time to listen to the discussion. And I'll be voting no. And for me, what it comes down to is I don't think it's the role of the government to subsidize employers who intentionally or unintentionally choose to misclassify their employees. I think um, those employers should pay for those. And so um, I'm glad that the intent here is to take care of those employees, but um, I think that those employers should be the ones that are responsible for that. Senator Westrom, you had your hand up. Do you still uh, wish to speak? I, not on this amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Senator Dreheim had his hand up again. And I'm not sure if it was this amendment or something else. I'll wait, Chair. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and uh, thank you, Senator Muhammad. I, I appreciate those comments. I just want to clarify. Um, this money is going to the employee, and it's not subsidizing the employer. The employer is paying this fine. The question is, what are we going to do with that fine? It's not the, gov it's not the government's money yet. It should be the workers' money from the very point in time that we collect it. So this is not a subsidy to the employer. This is just not allowing the state to use a penalty as a, as a de facto tax increase. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the A31 amendment of Senator Pratt? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Motion does not prevail. Further discussion or amendments? Senator Westrom, you had your hand up. Yes, you do again. Go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, I'd like to move the A33 amendment. Senator Westrom moves the A33 amendment. And Mr. Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Senator Westrom, while it's being distributed, go ahead. 
Mr. Chair, uh, what this amendment would do would uh, recognize uh, that this language is for educational purposes as a primary goal and compliance uh, with uh, employers in educating uh, them and employees what to do. And so it would structure or tier the fines. So somebody that's a repeat violator, uh, third, fourth, fifth time, would would be subject to a higher penalty. But let's not presume guilt and presume that education won't solve the problem. And so it would uh, set the set the fines up front first time at a lower level, and uh, then ramp up to higher levels if somebody is a repeat second or third violation. And so hopefully we can uh, find consensus on this. Uh, really, if this is about education and compliance, let's not villainize uh, every employer out there because that's uh, what we need to have jobs created. We need those employers that take risk and uh, dig into their savings and mortgage their house and take a, uh, a second job sometimes just to cover their own uh, payrolls. And so uh, hopefully we can find consensus on this, but it's just a simple tier structure. Uh, so Senator Umer verbatim, hopefully that'd be uh, something you could uh, work with and see uh, how this would be a win-win for enforcement education and compliance and only target those with repeat violations uh, over and over that that would be subject to the to the big significant fines and uh, hopefully we resolve most everything with the first fine a uh, education opportunity and um, I just think it becomes more harmonious and a more uh, advantageous environment for both Department of Labor working with the employers and the employees if they're mischaracterized. And uh, we need that type of a win-win situation and a positive working environment because we need our small businesses, uh, employers, and we need the good employees as well. And so I think this is a more reasonable approach if it's really about education and uh, compliance. And so hopefully uh, we could find consensus on this one. Senator Umu Verbaten on the A33 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to ask members to vote no on this amendment, and I just want to direct everyone to page 8 of the fiscal note, which I think is a really good summary of my point that the department has some important discretion here and some important factors that are laid out in statute to determine what the right size of that penalty should be. Um, that includes whether the violations were willful, the gravity of the violations, the number of violations, whether there's a history of past violations, whether the subjects of the investigation gained economic benefit in not complying in the law. I think those are the right things to determine the size of the penalty. Um, and you know that will look different depending on the case. I would prefer us leaning on these factors and not trying to prescribe it just solely based on the the uh, uh, the first violation, the second violation, or third. There are other important factors for the department to consider when determining what those fines are. Further discussion on the A33 amendment. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, would the commissioner uh, be able to come up and ask a couple of questions? Commissioner, welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner. So, Senator Umer Verbaten already to told us you have the authority to, um, uh, will have the authority to set the fines to be, to be appropriate. Uh, don't you already have that authority? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, yes, that's correct. Whenever the department has any type of discretionary penalty authority, we're required to look at those factors that are set forth in Chapter 14.045 uh, in determining the appropriate penalty. 
um, the penalties that are in this bill are uh, new penalties for misclassification uh, because there had not been specific penalties directly related to misclassification for the prohibited activities that are set forth in this bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner, so uh, what penalties did you have in place uh, for, for employers who willfully um, misclassified employees? Mr. Chair, um, Senator Pratt, uh, it depends on the industry and it depends on the situation. So if um, the misclass, like I mentioned earlier, if the misclassification resulted in failure to pay uh, proper wages, minimum wage or overtime, there were certain penalties that went along with that. If the um, if it's earned sick and safe time, there would be penalties that would go along with that. But there are often cases of misclassification where we don't see wage and hour violations, but where there is still misclassification. And there needs to be um, an incentive to comply with the law because right now the incentive to not comply with the law is it, uh, um, with regard to misclassification uh, is very high. Work comp insurance savings, um, other savings, not paying unemployment insurance tax, not paying um, the revenue or the uh, taxes on employee tax. Um, so these penalties are to try to disincentivize the, um, the act of misclassifying employees for financial gain. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. And so what you're saying is, is that um, you never collected those, those past due amounts um, from the employer in the past, and this is what uh, for those societal costs that we've been hearing about, right? The, uh, the back pay for uh, UI insurance, the back pay for, um, you know, any of the, of the FICA type of, of taxes. You're, you're not collecting, you're not assessing, your penalties aren't collecting for those, um, those deficiencies today. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, the Department of Labor and Industry is unable to assess penalties or collect back uh, unemployment insurance taxes, same with taxes that would be owed to the Department of Revenue. Um, where, where our focus is is under the statutes that are in our jurisdiction, and misclassification is one of those, both point seven two two and point seven two three, and those um, have not had penalties. Uh, the Office of Legislative Auditor Report that was recently released did specifically talk about how the penalties related to misclassification are not significant and are not um, deterring the, the conduct. Senator Pitt. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Pre Mr. Chair. Um, and, and in a lot of those where there wasn't a, a financial uh, hit to the employee, um, isn't it often a, just a case of, of education that needs to be that needs to be done? Why you want to continue to do the education piece that you're already doing, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt? Um, education is one aspect to the work the department does, and it's a very important aspect. But there also needs to be enforcement, and there also needs to be deterrence in the law. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and and uh, Commissioner. And for those deficient amounts, those societal costs, as we talked about on the last amendment, there's nothing in the fiscal note that um, covers those societal costs through that through that penalty phase. Um, is that correct, um, Sir Pratt? I, I think with a lot of our penalties, they um, they we assume that paying the penalty is one of the ways we help cover the cost of societal costs. It's not. We don't have to appropriate every time we have a penalty for something appropriated to be used to address those concerns. We could do that, but for smaller penalties like this, I think it would be a very complicated financial system to track what, what penalties are what purpose and how much we should allocate for various things to address those needs. So that's why we have the budget appropriation process. Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, Mr. Chair, as I, you know, as I've looked at the paid family medical leave, there's no an, an expectation that there's going to be ongoing general fund expenditures. The, the program is supposed to be self-sufficient. Um, and so what we're doing is we're assessing a penalty because there's societal cost to the misclassification. And 
yet we're pushing that out to the to the ratepayers uh, into that program simply because uh, we're not going to have a general fund expenditure. So it feels like the majority and the administration are trying to have it both ways, and this effectively becomes a tax increase through a penalty, and that's been and that's why I think Senator Westrom's amendment is so important, is that. We want to assess a penalty. We want to disincentivize someone from doing this. But I remember, you know, I remember working with the, the past um, uh, commissioner of, of uh, DLI, and she used to remind me that it was the Department of Labor and Industry. And it feels like we're not really looking at the concerns of the industry, of the employer in this case. And, and my fear is that with such an egregious um, or, or with such an extreme uh, penalty, particularly on small employers, that um, we could be putting people out of business and out of jobs. And I think the Western Amendment uh, is a way to um, make sure that we're stair-stepping this penalty so that it really hits the willful and repeated offenders and not the uh, not the accidental um, one-time offender. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I encourage members to vote for the 833. Further discussion on 833 amendment? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. No. 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 Motion does not prevail. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, oh, don't go away, Commissioner. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner, I noticed in the fiscal note on page 9, uh, there's an assumption, uh, and I'll just read it. Uh, the Department of Labor and Industry has issued one stop order in the last seven years. As a result of this bill, DLI anticipate it would issue approximately one stop order each year starting in fiscal year 2026. My question, Commissioner, is why do you expect to increase the number of stop orders by 700%? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, this bill does expand the authority of the stop work order uh, for the department to, uh, to help address the issue that has been growing. Senator Pratt. I'm sorry, we can't hear Senator Pratt. Sorry, I forgot to turn on my microphone. Uh, thank you, Senator Draheim. Uh, so, Commissioner, um, we're going to increase the number of stop orders on page 9 uh, of the fiscal note by 700% because you now have expanded authority. Um, are you just doing a stop order in, in, in one spot or are you doing a stop order in multiple locations? For example, um, if I have uh, a, a misclassified employee at one of my job sites or um, at one of my locations, am I, are you shutting down the entire company or are you just shutting down where you're finding the violation? Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, I guess I'll, the answer will depend on the, the circumstances, but what this allows us to do is issue a stop work order to the, the person slash entity that is found to be, after an investigation, is found to be in violation of the law. That may be on one site, that may be on a number of sites, but it is issued to the entity that has been misclassifying the employees. So that there may be... We had a recent case where we had 12 or 16 different work sites where we found rampant wage and hour violations. This would have allowed us to go and issue the stop work order on all 16 of those work sites for that contractor. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner, but you already have the authority to do those stop work orders today. Commissioner. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, this does allow us to expand the reasons uh, for the stop work order. So it would include, it could include things like wage and hour, but it could also include misclassification. 
Just one moment, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and um, Commissioner, can you point me to the bill specifically where you feel like you're getting that ad additional authority that you don't have today and, and what that impact might be? Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, um, so it allows us to issue the stop work order for engaging in the activities under subdivision 11 paragraph B, and that's in line 24.1. Um, and those uh, activities um, are as, re as reflected there. So that's broader than what the stop work order authority was prior. Uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, you know, um, in previous committees, DLI has, has said that these, you know, stop work orders are used sparingly, and it seems like um, we want to make them more common. Uh, there was a there was a a, a part above on, on stop work orders that said that they they could do it for investigation, which was a new language and. Um, which seems like that's why you would do a stop work order in the first place. It's clear to me, not only are we trying to raise uh, uh, taxes through penalties, but we're also uh, trying to vastly expand the interruption that employers, maybe uh, uh, mistaken employers instead of, instead of um, devious employers are trying to uh, uh, to do, I, I see no reason why I, it's. It seems. It seems excessive that we would expect a seven hundred percent increase when we've had one stop order in the last seven years, and the department is now telling us that they expect to do one every year. So, um, I, I don't know how to. I don't know how to resolve that. I, I've never, you know, in my time of as chair of 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 chair of, of jobs and labor, I and, and working with several commissioners and working with the current commissioner in her previous role, I I never had the um, it never came up as an issue that boy we just don't we just don't have enough authority to uh, um, to do our investigations and our evaluations, and boy we really need to shut down more of these of these job sites. It never came up. So I, to, to now say that we, in order, to, in order to do this job, we need to increase the number of, of interruptions by 700% seems excessive. And um, I'm, I'm very troubled by that section of the bill. And uh, I don't, I'll just, I guess I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I don't have a good way to close this other than... Um, this doesn't feel like a very even-handed approach. Senator Pratt, I, I understand that you're calling a 700% increase and the commissioner is saying it should be used sparingly, but with tens of thousands of work sites and an estimate they're going to use it one time a year, that, I'm sorry, that doesn't sound to me to be excessive, but I, we have a disagreement on that, obviously. Say, Senator, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. And, and Mr. Chair, to that point, I would say that, you know, if we've been doing it once every seven years, and it's not been a problem until until now, um, I, I find it I, I, it's it's the increase, right? Um, you may say that once per year is is not excessive, but when we've only needed one in every seven years, in that ratio, it becomes extremely excessive, and so I, I respectfully disagree, Mr. Chair. Further discussion on the bill? Senator Drayheim, did you have your hand up? No, I did not. Okay. Is there further discussion on the bill? <coughs> if not... Mr. Chair? Senator Pratt. Just a, a couple of closing comments. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, in my, in my previous role, I, um, I worked a lot with the uh, stakeholders that 
um, would be interested in this type of, of legislation. And we worked hard to make sure that uh, working Minnesotans weren't misclassified. We made sure that working Minnesotans got paid what they deserve. Um, you know, I'm proud to have been the author of the wage theft bill. I think there are some changes that need to be made, but um, all in all, I think we, we did a pretty good job of legislation. It was a bipartisan piece of legislation. And we worked with the trades, we worked with the employers, um, and, and um, despite some implementation uh, issues, um, I think we're finally at a, at a steady state. I would have been more, in, more than interested in having this discussion. Um, when I was chair. I would have been happy to have this discussion as a rank and file member on the jobs committee or the, you know, or the labor committee, but I'm not sure that that, that happened. And I'm, I'm concerned that we have lost that balance between employer and employee. I'm concerned that we've lost that balance between labor and industry. No one wants, no one, we should not tolerate misclassification. Absolutely not. We should be protecting working Minnesotans to make sure that they're paid what they deserve to be paid. That their pension or 401ks are being funded. That unemployment insurance is being funded so that they can collect it in case of a layoff. All those safety nets that we put in place. We should. We should not be using a penalty as a de facto tax increase. We should not be using this heavy hand to make every employer in the state rethink being in this state. I can tell you, Mr. Chair, I talked to an employer not too long ago who has offices in South Dakota and is telling me between the tax burden and the regulatory, and the regulatory burden they are seriously considering moving their headquarters to South Dakota. You know, I remember when Governor Walls was, uh, first came into office six years ago, he promised us regulatory humility. Senate file 4483, this bill on misclassification is anything but regulatory humility. And uh, members, I, I encourage us to vote against this bill. And let's take it back and let's work with all the stakeholders involved. Let's make sure working Minnesotans are protected, but let's not use this as a revenue raiser for the state in order to be spent somewhere else. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I encourage a no vote. Thank you, and Senator Murphy, and then final comments from Senator Mover Baton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know uh, we need to move to a vote. Um, I just want to mention that, uh, as I did when we heard this bill earlier this week, that the OLA did a report recently re recently released, uh, indicated that uh, the system that we have in place today isn't working and that this is a growing issue. Senator Umar Verbaten, I know you think you're before the Finance Committee, but right now I maybe think it is the tortured policymakers department that you're visiting. <laughs> um, I really appreciate your bill and I thank you for bringing it. I'm gonna vote yes. Finally, Senator Umar Verbaten on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, members, for the conversation. and. Um, really do appreciate uh, everyone's um, just urgency around making sure that uh, we we hold employers accountable for stealing wages and benefits and ultimately dignity from workers. Um, this issue of misclassification has absolutely been growing and we can just look to the OLA report to see that. Um, so we, we do need to change our approach. We do need better collaboration amongst our agencies. We do need to make sure that our agencies have the enforcement authority to stop this. We need to deter it because it's becoming a business practice. And I just want to say something that I've mentioned certainly in other committees, but really do want to um, make sure we hear this today that like this hurts law abiding business owners because misclassification ends up being a race to the bottom. And when you steal from workers, 
right? When you steal their wages, when you steal from our social safety net as well, we see that in the numbers. And these law-abiding businesses that are doing the right thing, that are paying the, their workers what they deserve, that are paying into the social safety nets, they can't compete with people who are stealing and who are defrauding the government and ultimately their workers. So it hurts everyone. We need this better collaboration. We need to make sure that there's that enforcement authority there. Um, and I, I look forward to um, continuing to move this bill through the process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Murphy moves that Senate Fell 4483 as amended be recommended to pass. On that motion, all those in favor say aye. Say aye. Those opposed? No. 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 Motion prevails. Thank you, Senator Umu Verbaten. And with that, we have completed the entire agenda for today. And next week, we will be meeting on Wednesday afternoon, I believe, <laughs> Thursday and Friday. Wednesday, we're going to hear the higher education omnibus bill and plan to begin an hour after the end of floor session in order to allow time for rules committee. And um, in the meantime, we hope that everybody who Celebrates has a good Passover, and we look forward to seeing people next Wednesday. With that, this meeting is adjourned.